Thank you, Cheryl. I, I appreciate the offer. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I, I usually I'm, I, I I can chew gum and walk at, two, at the same time sometimes, but I appreciate it. I'll let you know though. <laughs> so being Lafayette, um, there's a, there's a thing there's a, as a historian, which is my academic training. There's one thing to write about a, a historical subject or research a historical subject. Um, and think you know this historical subject well and enough to write about it and maybe publish and those things. It's another thing when you have to pretend to be them uh, in front of the public, uh, which is what I did for Colonial Williamsburg. And some of this, you know, some of what we'll talk about today um, will address some of that experience of mine and having to do that. Um, this is a wonderful picture of a much younger me standing on top of a much very beautiful horse um, that they let me ride when I was portraying Marquis Lafayette at Colonial Williamsburg. So who was he? Um, that's kind of the question, right? Um, and we'll get into that. This is what happens to me when I'm doing two things at once. Um, what we're going to cover today very simply are what's my relationship to Lafayette? Not, not genealogically, but how did I come to explore and discover Lafayette and his life and his history? Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about his family background, uh, where he came from, who he was, uh, familial speaking. Um, we'll talk about his military training, which is something that the vast majority of people um, who have heard the name Lafayette may not be familiar with. Uh, they're far more familiar with um, the fact, well, you'll see. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit about his role in the American Revolution. And then we'll end it with me uh, talking to you a little bit about what it was like to have to pretend to be him um, for people, which is a bit of a challenge. So what had I been taught? Probably the same that you'd been taught about, about who the Marquis de Lafayette was. Um, one thing you should know is if you're finding pictures of somebody from the 18th century and they're only a teenager or a child, you know they weren't your normal 18th century individual, right? So what I was taught, and like you, was that he was a nobleman, obviously, <clears throat> I was taught that he was young, right? We all knew that Lafayette was a young man when he came to America. Young is a relative thing. And we'll talk a little bit about what that meant in the 18th century versus what it means today. And I think most of us knew that he was pretty wealthy. Uh, we may not know how he got to be wealthy, but we know that he was wealthy. And those are really the three fundamental things. My son right now is taking an AP American history class in his high school. And I think these are about the fundamental things they cover about the Marquis de Lafayette. They don't go into a whole lot of detail about his life and nor would I expect them to. But one of the things you'll hear me talk about through the course of this talk probably because I can't help myself <laughs> is the idea that um, the Marquis de Lafayette has a lot of uh, correlation to a movie that came out uh, with Tom Hanks called Forrest Gump. And you'll understand why as I go through it a little bit. Um, but every it's one of the reasons why yesterday on our social media platforms, I posted a picture pre previewing this talk of basically Forrest Gump on a bench with Lafayette's head. And we'll get into why I, why I think that way and why that's stuck in my craw. Um, and it's just the nature of his life. So how did I become <clears throat> a fan or a historian or a student of the Marquis de Lafayette? Well, it started with a wonderful teacher, like all things do in our lives. Um, I had a professor when I was an undergraduate student at the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. That's a picture of a much younger me and my IUP student card back in the day when they stuck your social security number on everything, which is why it's blurred out. Um, and the building behind you is Keith Hall at, at Indiana University of Pennsylvania, which was the history department's building, which has long since been demolished. Um, and I had a professor named Ernest Fricke, and he was, a, he was, as you can see here, he was a Fulbright scholar. He was an amazing professor of history. And I had him for a course on the history of the French Revolution. And that's where I really became exposed to the Marquis de Lafayette as more than the American revolutionary icon that we as Americans are taught about, right? We know about, or we believe we know about the, the Marquis de Lafayette's life as, as an American soldier and, and in the American revolution. But then we tend to forget the fact that this man lived into the 1800s, uh, well into the 1800s, uh, to the point where he was so old, he was old enough and still alive that they brought him back in the 1820s to kind of rejuvenate the American patriotic fervor, right? They brought him on a, on a, on a tour of this, the United States. So he lived a long life and a very interesting life. And we need to understand that as to understand him as a person. And so studying during the French Revolution got me excited about here's this person 
who I thought I knew, as all Americans think they know our American revolutionary icons. And through this course and through Professor Fricke, um, I discovered a whole other individual. Uh, and, and that's really the important point, right? I discovered that this was an individual. This was a person, right? Uh, and we have to remember that about some of our, our founding fathers and, and, and our main historical figures is that they were human beings. And we'll talk about Lafayette's uh, humanity uh, quite a bit, I think, at least I try. So what wasn't he? All right. Um, the image, if any of you are big fans of the show called Black Adder, which was, you know, an old British television show, uh, back in the day, uh, you'll remember this is a gentleman, an actor portraying a French fop or a dandy. And that is not what Lafayette was. Um, he was not a fop or a dandy or a man who was concerned with his clothes appearance <clears throat> in an effective and excessive way. That is how he is portrayed quite often. As a matter of fact, it's how I got involved in portraying the Marquis de Lafayette um, for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Um, I had finished my undergraduate work. I've been working at Colonial Williamsburg for, for a few years. And I attended a public program they were doing that included uh, the character, quote unquote, of the Marquis de Lafayette as part of the program. And the young man they had portraying him was an actor. We called them character interpreters at the time, uh, but he was an actor. And when I when I saw his Lafayette, he was dressed in these incredibly fancy French clothing. He had a powdered face. He had a big wig on. And what I had studied about Lafayette uh, as an undergraduate, I knew that that was not who this man was. And so it was important for me. Uh, and it was, I don't, I don't know if it was, I don't know, I don't know if it was important for me, but, but I saw this portrayal of Lafayette and I saw the crowds of visitors at Colonial Williamsburg surrounding this actor and wanting to talk to him, um, which he couldn't do because he didn't speak French and he didn't know anything about the Marquis de Lafayette. So it was difficult for him to actually interact with our visitors. And I thought to myself, we can do this better. Right? We can do this better. And the problem with a wonderful place like Colonial Williamsburg, which is very much like working in a university setting, as opposed to just a museum or a business, um, was that I went to the manager of that particular program and I said, you know, this is not who Lafayette is. And I showed him a couple books and some writings that I had done. And I said, you know, we, we can't be portraying Lafayette as this kind of individual to the public. And Mark, who was the manager at the time, he says to me, you know what, no, that's, you're, you're exactly right, Noel. So here's what I'm going to do you're going to play Lafayette from now on. So that's how I ended up playing Lafayette, was sticking my nose where it didn't belong uh, uh, and not wanting him to be depicted uh, as the gentleman you see in this image. So let's talk a little about his family, uh, his family history. Uh, this is, his father is on the left, his mother is on the right. Um, now we'll talk a little, I'll get a little bit into his father's family history in a minute, but I wanted you to see images of them. Again, these are not your average 18th century individuals uh, who most people did not have wonderful paintings of them done on a regular basis. Uh, but the Lafayettes, uh, who were actually not the Lafayettes, the Lafayette is their title. Um, they were the Demotier family, which is the family line that Lafayette came from. Um, you can see below there is his name, Marie Joseph Paul Ive Rochelbert de Motier, the Marquis de Lafayette. Now, of course, his father was the Marquis de Lafayette first, uh, and he received that title um, through, well, I'm backing up, see, I get ahead of myself. Uh, the family was not from Paris, right? The Motiers were nowhere near Paris. They were from a little town called Chavignac, which is in Auvergne, and it's a very rural, it's a very uh, hilly, mountainous, rocky uh, province of France. Uh, the nobles there uh, there's a wonderful story about the young noble. So you have to picture Lafayette in this case, uh, born in you know 1757, that the only way you could tell the noble children from these regular village children in these small uh, rural uh, French towns was the fact that the noble children all carried little wooden swords with them. And that was their way of showing everybody that these were the children of nobility. Now, the Motiers were not a particularly wealthy family, um, but uh, they were married smart. This is his father. Again, wonderful painting of his father. Um, his father served, as you can see, as an officer in the personal bodyguard, or I should say his Lafayette's grandfather, so Motier's father's father, served as an officer in the personal bodyguard of King Louis the XV. Um, he was actually, his grandfather, Lafayette's grandfather was killed in battle. Um, his father, his father's brother, uh, his uncle, Lafayette's uncle was also killed uh, in battle while serving during the war of the Polish succession in 1733 to 38. 
And Lafayette's father was killed in battle in 1759 when Lafayette was only two years old uh, while serving as a colonel of the Grenadiers of France. So remember I mentioned Forrest Gump? <laughs> and if you remember from that movie, there's a character called Lieutenant Dan. And Lieutenant Dan always talks about uh, he's angry at Forrest for saving his life because he says it was his destiny to die on the battlefield. Uh, that was Lafayette in many ways. The Lafayette family received their title, the Marquis de Lafayette. They received their title through military service. Lafayette's family was a lifetime, go, they claim going back to Joan of Arc, uh, serving with the armies of Joan of Arc as a military family. That's how they earned their title. That's how they earned their lands. Uh, it was in the service of their king in a military setting. So Lafayette was was essentially destined uh, to be a soldier. And if you asked him, he would tell you he was destined to die on the battlefield, just as Lieutenant Dan was. That was the nature of being a motier at the time, or Lafayette. Now, his mother, different story. <laughs> uh, his mother was from Paris. Uh, she was the wife of a very, she, she was the daughter of a very wealthy family, uh, descendant of Louis the, Louis the Ninth. Uh, I'm not gonna bore you with all these titles, um, there's a lot of them, um, other than just to tell you that most of her family were also military officers, but they were wealthy um, and they were very connected to the court, uh, to the court of the king. And so they were in Paris and they lived in Paris. That's where their home was. Uh, so you can imagine her her fear and, and how horrible it was for her to have to leave Paris to move to this craggy little chateau in Auvergne with her husband. Right. So. It's a very, very uh, wealthy. This is where Lafayette got his wealth. The title came from his father, Marquis Lafayette. The wealth came from his mother's side of the family, and we'll see how that how that affected him later. Now, shortly after uh, Lafayette's uh, husband's Lafayette's father's death in 1759, his mother doesn't want to live in in in, in Auvergne anymore, so she moves back to Paris, and for a while. Um, Lafayette's uh, maternal or paternal grandparents were raising him in, in Chavagnac. But then in 1770, his mother dies. And then and then, then shortly after his mother dies, her father dies. OK. Now, this is important for Lafayette, because what happens. Is the money because he's now he's already been the Marquis de Lafayette. When his father died, he became the new Marquis de Lafayette. When his mother dies in 1770, when Lafayette's only three or four years old, now he inherits the wealth of his mother's family and he becomes one of the wealthiest uh, noblemen in all of France as a result of, of inheriting the money from his mother's side of the family. His great grandfather, this gives you an idea of how young people are having children back in the day, right? His great grandfather, the Comte de la Rivière, becomes Lafayette's garden, guardian and has him moved to Paris. The important thing to understand about the Comte de la Riviere is that he was a military person, right? And he thought it was very important for Lafayette to get that kind of training. So now Lafayette is three to four years old. He's in Paris. He's put in school, right? He's put in school. I, I shouldn't say three or four. He's 13 or 14. I apologize. 13 or 14 years old. And shortly after this, his great grandfather, who's now his, his, uh, is a, a basically a guardian gets him a commission in his own old regiment called the king's musketeers you've heard of the king's musketeers right all for one and one for all that's that's this group i mean my battery is running low hold on one second folks i thought i was all plugged in i mean double, double check one minute there we go all right now we're good Sorry about that, folks. I thought I had plugged my laptop. So he becomes a lieutenant in the King's Musketeers when he's 14 years old. That might sound odd to us. Um, in the 18th century for a nobleman, it really isn't. Um, that was when mere military training started. And we'll get into why that's important later when we start talking about Lafayette and the Revolution. So he's a lieutenant in the King's Musketeers. They don't really do anything. They drill on, in, at Versailles. Um, they march around. Every day, one of their officers would go to the king and say, King, do you have any orders? And the king would say back to him, there are no orders. And they go back to their to their, build, their their barracks. So that was kind of the life of a king's musketeer in 1771. But it was a good training place for Lafayette. It was a good place for him to learn. Um, he also joined what was called the academy. He also had, had him enrolled. Lafayette's great-grandfather had him enrolled 
in the Academy de Versailles, which was a school for teaching young military officers. So he's learning tactics, he's marching, he's drilling. It was also very common for young officers who didn't attain, attend formal military schooling, big formal military schooling, to have to serve as privates, as lowly privates in their units to learn the basics of being a soldier. So all this is happening to Lafayette when he's 13, 14, 15 years old. So be, he's years yet from coming to America, but he's already learning the skills and the job of what it means to be a soldier. And more importantly, for what he did later, what it meant to be an officer in, in, in a large army. Now, naturally, he had a uh, he had a commission. He was now an officer in the, in the French army. He had a lot of money, right? Um, and so now the next logical thing that his great-grandfather thought was to arrange a marriage for him. <laughs> now he's 14 years old uh, when this all starts. So, the, and the family he finds for him and the person he finds for him is a young girl named marie Antoine Francois de Noailles. She's from a, the very famous du de Noailles family, the Comte de Noailles, the Duc d'Ayen. Uh, they were they had their own regiment called the Noailles Dragoons. Uh, so, I mean, they were a very wealthy family. But most importantly, and why they wanted this arranged marriage for Lafayette, was the Noailles were incredibly close to court. They were incredibly close to the king. And so it put Lafayette now from being just a military officer with a lot of money, it now made him become a courtier. So he was at court on a regular basis. When the, when the couple were married, Lafayette was 15, Adrienne was 13. Uh, an important point about this though, I think is that uh, Adrienne's, and I call her Adrienne because that was what she went by. Uh, um, Adrienne's uh, mother, her mother insisted that Lafayette live with the family before they got married so that Adrienne would actually like him, which is a hard thing for us to understand today. This was an arranged marriage. But it was important to the mother and to the family that Adrienne liked and ultimately loved her husband, her future husband. And by all accounts, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, um, that love was real. Um, so Lafayette at this time moves into the into the residence uh, of the Noailles family called it was called the Hotel de Noailles. It still exists today in Paris. I don't know if you can stay there or not, but it's still there. Um, Lafayette was given another commission this time as a lieutenant in the Noailles Dragoons, which was his his in laws' family's regiment. And then it's so this is at 16 years old, right? Lafayette has been in the French army in one capacity or another for five years already. Right? Since the age of 11, he had been training. So this is really something important to keep in mind when we start talking about Lafayette. And when you think about how you've been told about Lafayette, or that he was just a young man, just a young man. And they made him a general, right? Remember, he'd been in the French army at the age of 16 for five years already. The marriage to Adrian was formalized in April 1774. So Lafayette is now, let's see, what is that? 16, 17 years old when they're formally married and she is 15. Now, I think there's important things going on here. So I missed something. No, here we go. I thought I missed something. So shortly after Lafayette, shortly after the wedding itself, the formal wedding, Lafayette then is commissioned as a captain in the Noaia Dragoons. So now he's a captain. If you know anything about military history, that means he controls a company of men, responsible for a company of men. And as a captain uh, responsible for a company of dragoons, and I should also probably say that dragoons are mounted, so, so they ride horses, uh, in case you weren't aware, just to make sure. Um, what he does is that in this capacity is he takes part in these maneuvers that were going on with the French army. And I can't, I could give a whole class on the French army after the Seven Years' War and what they were trying to do to get better and improve. Suffice it to say, what they were doing, one of the things they were doing was, it, particularly this army, this portion of the army that Lafayette's regiment belonged to, um, they would do these large scale maneuvers um, near, near a town called Metz, which is in the northeast of France. Um, and they did this every year. And these maneuvers sometimes incorporated 40,000 men, where they would do these mock battles and they would try out all these new tactics and techniques um, that they were learning. And the, and the French were leading the way in learning these techniques. As a matter of fact, uh, there's another name of another officer you'll you'll know who was also taking part in a lot of these kinds of maneuvers at the same time, and his name was Napoleon. Um, this was the era in which Napoleonic tactics were being taught to the young officers like Lafayette, like Napoleon, um, and that would then later be used so effectively by Napoleon against other European armies. Lafayette was at the spear point of these tactics. He was learning these every year, practicing them, reading these textbooks that were being given to these officers about the the necessary tactics and strategies 
that men commanding large amounts of men on the battlefield would need. There's no chance that on any battlefield Lafayette saw in America that he ever saw 40,000 men at one time, right? But he saw that every year when he was training with his regiment at Metz. Now, this is where it gets kind of important for Lafayette because there's other things going on at Metz as well. Another wonderful point painting of Lafayette. And that's in his Noia Dragoons uniform. So he's looking pretty good. So one of the people he meets while he's at Metz is a gentleman named Marshal, Marshal Comte de Broglet. So this is in 1775, 1776. So the American Revolution has already begun, right? And if you remember the beginning of the American Revolution, uh, General Washington was not doing so hot, right? He had been driven out of New England. He'd been driven out of New York. He'd been driven across New Jersey, right? So things are not going well for Washington. At least that's the news that's coming back to France. And so the Marshal, Marshal Comte de Broglie has a plan. And this is a plan that is very common and can occur in 18th century military circles. Comte de Broglie's plan was to send French officers to serve in America. Those French officers would then lay the groundwork for the Comte de Broglie to come over and take command of the American army fighting the British in America, right? Since Washington was doing so poorly. Sounds odd to us. But being a soldier in the 18th century was a profession. And when there wasn't a war going on in your particular country, you wanted to practice your profession. And Broglie wanted to practice his profession and believed he could do that in America by, by superseding George Washington. One of his principal uh, conspirators, co-conspirators in this effort was the Baron Johann de Kalb. Uh, you might remember de Kalb. He serves in America as well. Uh, and his job was to recruit these young officers, right? So here you have young Lafayette. He's very eager to become uh, a military officer and a soldier. He's very wealthy because that's something Broglie didn't have for his plan, I should mention. Broglie didn't have any money to make his plan happen. He just needed... He just wanted to make it happen. Lafayette had the money. The other thing Lafayette had was were the connections at court that he had gotten through his marriage. So one day, uh, Lafayette, and Lafayette's, you know, he's hearing these discussions, but he's not really latched on to them um, in any meaningful way. But one day, George III's brother, the Duke of Gloucester, is attending these maneuvers at Metz. And again, this is the 18th century. So this may sound odd to you that that a British, uh, you know, British officer and king and brother of the brother of the King of England is just hanging out while the French are practicing their military techniques. But that was the nature of, of being a nobleman in the 18th century. But during this, this one dinner that Lafayette is in attendance at, um, the, uh, the Duke of Gloucester starts talking about the colonies and, and, and he's not a fan of his brother's uh, policies over there. And he's, and he's very, actually very pro-American in his viewpoint of the American Revolution. And suddenly Lafayette hears this and he starts to get, and, and the gears start clicking around in his head. And he's still a little hesitant because, again, you know, he's an officer in the French army. He's technically not allowed to go just go leave and do this thing. So he, he's still hesitant. But in June 1776, uh, as part of all of this stuff going on with the French army, all these improvements they're trying to make, um, the, the Comte de Saint Germain, who is the, the, mil the minister of war for the king, he starts these re re reforms of the French army. And among those reforms is taking young men who have never seen battle and making them reserve officers. So you are no longer going to be an active officer in the French army. We're going to put you in reserve and we're going to promote officers, young officers who've actually seen action. And so what happens is in June 1776, Lafayette is put on the reserve list. And what that effectively means is his active military career in the French army is done. It's over. He has to go back to his little chateau in Chavignac or the Hotel de Noailles in Paris and go to a bunch of dances with the king and queen and become a courtier, but his time being a soldier is over. Remember, he's Lieutenant Dan. He has a destiny. He's also, at this point, you might notice, he's also kind of Forrest Gump. If you remember, Forrest Gump goes through his life falling into these relationships with these famous people, right? Meeting random famous people. By the time Lafayette is 70, in 1776, he's met the king of France, Marie Antoinette. He's met the Comte de Broglie, the Duke of Gloucester. He's bouncing off all of these very famous uh, people in 18th century Europe. And it gets even better. Now, while at the same time, this is the same time Comte de Broglie is scheming to come to America and take over for Washington, Continental Congress has sent Silas Dean to France with the sole purpose of recruiting French officers. 
but basically recruiting four French officers, and they wanted them to be engineers, um, because that was something that was sorely lacking in the American Continental Army at the time. But needless to say, Baron de Kalb introduces Lafayette to Silas Dean, and, and, and Lafayette is there, and they stress his rank, you know, he, he's a captain, so he has some experience. They stress his family connections with court, that he's very connected at court, so it's very important. And then they stress his wealth, that he has a lot of money, and that might be helpful to the American cause. And so what Silas Dean does, and he does this a lot, is he grants a commission to Lafayette as a major general in the Continental Army. Now, what does that mean? Major general is in charge of a division of troops, a large, one of the largest div, uh, segments of an army is, it's, is a division. Um, so you think about the 28th Infantry Division of Pennsylvania or whatever Ohio's equivalent is of that. Um, you know, these are large bodies of troops. And at this time, it's 1776, Lafayette is 19 years old. Right? And he is now given a commission of Major General of the Continental Army. So what do you do if you're Lafayette and your destiny now is to go to America and be a soldier? Well, you don't go small. Um, you purchase a ship and he purchases a ship called the Victory, which is which he names the Victory. He loads it up with a bunch of other French officers. He loads it up with a bunch of French books. He loads it up with military books. He loads it up with a bunch of French, English language books so he can learn to speak English. DeKalb comes with him. Um, and in 1777, they set out for America with his major general commission in his pocket. Again, all of this a result of his family connections, right? His wealth, his, his military connections from his father's side of the family and also from his in-law side of the family and his wealth from his mother's side of the family. When they first arrive in America, Lafayette's men, uh, the ship lands in Charleston, South Carolina, because they're afraid to try to actually enter uh, Philadelphia because of the British blockade. Um, so they come, they land at Charleston. Uh, they go overland to Philadelphia. By the time they arrive, uh, they're, they're a little disheveled, right? They've been on the road for a while. But Lafayette, the first thing Lafayette wants to do is go to Congress and, and present his papers to Congress. They get there. They knock on the door. A clerk comes out, won't even let him in the building, right? A bunch of these disheveled Frenchmen. Silas Dean has sent so many young French officers over with, with pieces of paper saying they're going to be officers in the Continental Army that Congress, quite frankly, is a little sick of it. And so they don't even let him in the building. So Lafayette and his party then re retire to their, their inn. They get cleaned up. He puts on his official uh, Duke Dragoon uniform. And then they all go over and then they and with their papers. And then they realize, Congress realizes uh, who Lafayette is. Not who he is as a soldier, because they don't really know that, because Lafayette hasn't really stressed that. But they do know that he's very connected at court, and they know that he has a great deal of money available to them in the event that, that they give him his commission. And so Congress gives him a commission. They, they approve his commission as a major general, although in their language, it's clearly honorary. They don't want him commanding a division. They make that very clear. And from that meeting, Lafayette then goes off and meets Washington for the first time. Lafayette writes about this meeting with Washington uh, as if it was a kind of a, as if it was a, a religious experience for him. He says he walks into the room and it was almost like there was a light behind Washington. He knew who he was immediately. Laf Washington had this air about him uh, and, and Lafayette meets Washington the first time, greets him. Uh, they speak for a while. Uh, Lafayette has gotten his English is fairly good by this time. Um, I should mention he had an American art student on the victory with him who helped teach him English. Um, and at that time, Washington offers him a position on his personal staff, essentially as an aide to camp. But what becomes very apparent uh, immediately upon meeting Washington, and this is with all the French officers in Lafayette's group and all the French officers associated with the Broglie plan, the uh, plan falls apart when these men met George Washington, which should tell you an awful lot about the character of George Washington as a leader that the minute they met him, despite of Washington's recent failures on the battlefield, <clears throat> that these French officers were instantly were, knew that there was no way they were ever going to be able to replace Washington with Broglie, that he was too beloved by his men, by his officers, that there was no way that they, this was going to work. So the Broglie plan essentially dissolves at that point. <clears throat> now, Washington, Lafayette is, you know, again, he's a soldier. He has a destiny to fulfill. And so he's not he's not content uh, to sit on the sidelines uh, as an aide-de-camp to General Washington. And so what happens is that 
he doesn't, he basically goes into battle. He chooses to do that. <clears throat> the Battle of Brandywine, shortly after he arrives uh, in Philadelphia, the Battle of Brandywine, Lafayette is watching the battle with Washington and requests permission from Washington to go and serve with a group of French. These were French officers who had been come over, but had their commissions refused. And so they all had enlisted as privates. And so there was a group of them serving with uh, John Sullivan's uh, division uh, at Brandywine. And Lafayette goes over and rides over there with them and, and is just riding around. And if you, if you know Washington's history <clears throat> and you remember Washington's history, particularly at the Battle of, of the Monongahela when he was with General Braddock, it's a very similar story with one difference. And we'll get to the difference in a second. During the Battle of Monongahela, it was people wrote about Washington riding around, uh, you know, trying to get men to fight, bullets whizzing all around him. And yet he never got a scratch. It was almost like he was divinely uh, preserved for future, for the future at, at, at the Battle of Monongahela. The same thing was happening to Lafayette at the Battle of Brandywine. He was riding up and down the line, encouraging soldiers to get back into line, leading bayonet charges while musket balls are whizzing around him. The difference is Lafayette got shot um, <clears throat> and Lafayette was wounded. He was shot through the, through the, through the leg, through the calf. Didn't even notice it at first. Um, he was running around and he looks down and there was blue, uh, blood pouring out of the top of his boot. So he ends up <clears throat> going back onto his horse and riding back to headquarters where it's treated. The ball passed right through his, through his calf, didn't strike bone, didn't hit an artery. He was sent to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, um, where he was, uh, nurtured, uh, uh, nursed back to health, and then shortly after returns back to headquarters uh, in, in the fall of 1777 again, where he takes place part in another battle. This time, uh, there's some Hessian troops across the road in New Jersey who are moving towards trying to get closer to the American lines. Lafayette goes out there with yet with another as a kind of a ride along, for lack of a better term. And while there, basically, uh, drives the troops, the Hessians, back through the town of Gloucester, New Jersey, out of their fortified positions, um, and does all of this very quickly and easily. Um, and it was shortly after this that Washington and the other officers in Washington the Circle realized the training that Lafayette had received in Metz and as a young soldier uh, were far greater than most of the major generals serving on, La on Washington's in, in the Continental Army at the time. Uh, most major generals serving in Washington the extent of their military experience was mili as militia officers, if that, uh, with the exception of Charles Lee, Horatio Gates, who had been British officers, the vast majority had no real military training. Um, Lafayette showed very quickly during the Battle of Brandywine and the Battle of Gloucester, New Jersey, that he was the real deal. This was not just a young, rich, you know, uh, nobleman. This was a man who knew his trade and knew what it meant to be an officer. And so in December of 1777, he actually, his commission goes from being honorary to being a, a real major general's commission. And to Lafayette's uh, delight, he is given command of a division of Virginia troops. Now, Lafayette takes pay, place part in a lot of battles during the American Revolution and in a lot of actions, uh, and a couple of them are more important than others. Uh, in January and February of 1778, he was assigned to be the commander of an invasion of Canada. Uh, that invasion never happened. Um, at the Battle of Barron Hill, Pennsylvania, outside Philadelphia, um, he managed to extricate himself from a, a trap. Uh, uh, the British uh, commanders in Philadelphia had this plan to, to, quote, have Lafayette for dinner, which meant they were going to send troops out to capture him, bring him back to Philadelphia, and then have him at dinner, have him at a dinner party that they would give. Um, luckily, he was able to extricate his men very quickly uh, from Barron Hill. There's a great story about him, which we'll talk about later. Uh, he then takes play, part in the battles of Newport, Rhode Island. In 1779, he returns to France for a short time. <clears throat> uh, part of it is to lobby France for more supplies for the for the for the uh, Americans. But then, while he's there, he he plans these raids of the English coast uh, with John Paul Jones, and they're going to load up a bunch of troops onto some of John Paul Jones' vessels. They're going to attack British port cities. They're going to hold them ransom, and then they're going to do that all throughout. Uh, England. And the purpose of that is to draw the English Navy away from America so that, so that the American army can have a little bit more freedom to act, action. Those raids never actually happened, but they were planned and they were the brainchild of Lafayette, John Paul Jones, and Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he then returns to America in 1780. He's given command in Virginia, 
which is very important uh, because what's happening in Virginia at that time is Charles Cornwallis and Benedict Arnold are ravaging North Carolina and Virginia uh, and rounding up loyalists. So they send Lafayette, they send him with some Pennsylvanians, including a wonderful guy named Mad Anthony Wayne. Um, and they send them down there to, to basically put a check on Cornwallis. Lafayette has this campaign in Virginia in 1781 where he's kind of uh, tit for tatting with Cornwallis. He's keeping close enough to Cornwallis to keep Cornwallis nervous, but never close enough for there to be an actual engagement. Um, at the Battle of Jamestown Ford or Green Springs, it's sometimes called in July of 1781, uh, they draw Lafayette. Cornwallis draws Lafayette into a bit, bit of a trap. But again, because of Lafayette's ability as a field general uh, and with the help of man Anthony Wayne, he's able to extricate his troops from that engagement uh, without causing any great damage to his to his men. Uh, and then Cornwallis eventually ends up shortly after that at Yorktown. And we all know what happens after that. The Battle of Jamestown Ford is one of the most important battles of Lafayette's career, if you want to understand him as a general, because it is truly the only battle in his entire life where he was in sole command of the battlefield. Usually he was under somebody else, but at, at Green Springs, he was the field general commanding the battle. And so if you want to learn who he was as a soldier, you really have to study that battle. Um, I wrote a master's thesis on it, so that's why I, I think it's kind of important. Now, let's get into what I had to do. So, if you've been to Colonial Waynesburg, um, you, you've probably had the experience of interacting with a character interpreter. I mentioned to you my experience of doing that uh, when I first met La the first person doing Lafayette and how upset I was, or dis disappointed is probably a better word I was, for how the portrayal was being done. Um, basically, they were portraying Lafayette, and quite frankly, many of these individuals, <clears throat> all as characters right? Uh, not as, as human beings and as individuals. The challenge with wanting to portray these, in, these people as individuals and wanting to do these public programs that we did was you had to know as much as possible about the individual you were portraying in order to be able to do that. So once I was given the responsibility of both portraying the Marquis of Lafayette and organizing the programming around uh, his life, that's when it became <clears throat> kind of important to really delve into what his whole life was like, who he was as a person. Um, as opposed to simply um, what he looked like in a painting uh, or what you might have thought Lafayette would have looked like. Um, so it involved reading all of his his published letters, his unpublished letters, uh, looking at the archives, going through letters, of other people writing about him. <clears throat> uh, because oftentimes what people will write in a letter is different from what they'll say out loud, right? We all know that. Sometimes it's a little more personal. So if you really want to know who Lafayette was, you want to read what men like Anthony Wayne, Washington, uh, and other officers were writing about him in their private letters to one another. And you got a real feel for who he was. It's also important when you're going to do public programming like this, um, that's me in the front there with a white and black plume. Uh, a number of other, the gentleman right to my right is a gentleman, Pete Picard, who portrayed my aide de camp. Uh, the person behind him is uh, Tom Hay, who portrayed Mad Anthony Wayne. Uh, all of these individuals now were character interpreters who had real people in their, in their, in their, in their character. So they had to be able to do that. And the kind of programming we decided to do was programming that allowed for people to actually speak with these individuals. So now if you're going to speak with these individuals, you have to be ex you have to expect pretty much every possible question you're going to get. And the only way again to do that effectively um, was to research their life intensely. Right. So when a young child comes up and asks you about your mother, or when a young child comes up and asks you about what's the name of your horse or what's, you know, those kind of questions. Those are particularly children, but all, adults also. Um, you know, those are questions you want to be able to answer for them, right? Because Lafayette would have been able to answer those questions, right? And you don't want to break that character. Right? Um, the painting on the right is a painting of Lafayette that was commissioned immediately after the American Revolutionary War um, in it. He is wearing uh, his Continental Army uniform that he wore uh, in Virginia in 1781. So when the time came for us to develop the, the, the costume, the uniform that I had to wear to portray the Marquis de Lafayette for our public programs, that this is the painting we used to base that uniform on. Um, I even had uh, the shoemakers at Colonial Waynesburg even made me um, custom uh, riding boots, uh, dragoon boots that I basically had were like putting on sausage skins. Um, you could basically see the muscles in my calf through these things, they were so tight, but they were incredibly 
accurate and and depicted Lafayette as he looked truly looked in 1781. Um, again, these public programs were designed um, to get the to give people a better understanding of who Lafayette was. Right? Again, looking at his whole family history and everything that we know we knew about him that had been written about him up to that time, as well as his own writings. Um, you'll note in these images that uh, I'm not wearing a wig because it was well known that Lafayette did not wear a wig during the American Revolution. He wore his hair short, <clears throat> closely cropped. Uh, the only time he would have been putting on a wig would have been in the presence of, of, of royalty or, or a court. So he, when he was on campaign, he never wore a wig. He looked like an officer. He looked like a normal human being. Right? And, and quite frankly, looking at these pictures, he was a pretty damn handsome one as well. Uh, the gentleman on my left in this is a, is a man named Mark Schneider. Uh, Mark is best known in the, in the world right now um, for his portrayals of Napoleon. He portrays Napoleon both in Europe and in the United States. And when I stopped portraying the Marquis de Lafayette, I handed over that responsibility to Mark. And Mark continues to play the Marquis de Lafayette today at Colonial Williamsburg. So if you go to Colonial Williamsburg and you see the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, you're seeing Mark Schneider. Uh, in this role, he's portraying uh, one of my cavalry officers during the 1781 campaign, another Frenchman by the name of Armand. Uh, this image represents one of my most favorite uh, programs we ever did there, where we had all of our troops lined up on Duke of Gloucester Street, we had all of our cavalry, and we trotted down the street uh, abreast of the whole width of the street. And it was just one of the, I wish I could have watched it, quite frankly, rather than be in it. Uh, again, the kind of public programming we did uh, was interactive. It gave our visitors at Colonial Williamsburg the opportunity to actually speak to these people. So on the left, you see myself and Mark Schneider or, or Colonel Armand uh, in, a, in one of the rooms in the courthouse where we are drinking wine and eating bread and are surrounded. We are surrounded by visitors at Colonial Williamsburg who are asking us questions about the 1781 campaign, who are asking us questions about our families, about our wives, about our children, about our horses, about, you name it, they're asking. On the right is another one of these programs we would do at, at President's Day. Uh, the gentleman on the right there, the tall gentleman is a man named Garland Wood. Uh, one of my best friends and mentors from Colonial Williamsburg. Uh, Garland portrayed George Washington for many years. Um, uh, this is when Washington, this is depicting when Washington arrived at Yorktown, um, when Corn or arrived at Williamsburg before Yorktown, uh, when Lafayette was using the George Wythe House as his headquarters. Um, and that's me as Lafayette. Uh, and that is, uh, I can't remember, I forget who the gentleman behind him is portraying. And then that's George Washington playing, Was or Garland playing George Washington. We didn't do this scene exactly as it played out in, in the historical record, because in the historical record, Washington was riding into town. Lafayette was on his horse and Lafayette galloped up to Washington on his horse, wrapped both arms around him and gave him two giant kisses on his cheeks. So you can imagine a reserve man like Washington uh, and having Lafayette ride up and, and give him that kind of greeting as soon as he rides into town. I spared Garland that greeting. The joy of portraying someone like Lafayette is I got, to, I got to work with some incredible partners. Um, this is a photograph of my daughter, actually, uh, when she was much, much, much younger. Um, I worked with a very, uh, the archivist at Lafayette College, which holds many of Lafayette's records and papers, a large number of them, as well as a large number of uh, objects that belong to Lafayette. Uh, on the left is my daughter holding Lafayette's uh, sword, one of his swords. Uh, and on the right is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it, is, it is my daughter wearing a ring uh, that Lafayette had given to his daughter. Um, so it's a, it's a very kind of sweet picture for me. And I'm tearing up a little bit. So, you know, when we think about Lafayette, uh, and, and I could go on and on about the people that he bounced off of in his life um, and the famous people that he interacted with over the course of his life. Uh, you know, there, there's a story of him. Um, he met before he came to France, he was sent to London uh, just while while they're loading up the victory with everything, he sent to London for a short time, and he has an audience with George III. I mean, he, he's meeting all of these famous people: Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. You know, if if they were an important individual in 18th century America or Europe, Lafayette met them and knew them. And in that way, he's that Forrest Gump character. He goes through life, you know, just you know, just kind of meeting all these famous people. But at the same time, he's that Lieutenant Dan character, right? Where he felt like his destiny was to be on the battlefield. And it's unfortunate that he didn't serve uh, in a military capacity later in life um, for I think we'd have a lot more to go on about him as a military officer if he had. 
Uh, these are just some articles that I've written about the La about Lafayette as part of my my graduate work. Um, uh, I will again, I'll put links to these um, so you can access all of them uh, on the OGS website uh, after I get the webinar posted to so be able to read these stories about Lafayette. Um, I will make the argument that these most of these were written back in the late 1990s, uh, early 2000s. Uh, the the scholarship about Lafayette, um, both as a military officer and as a as an individual, has gotten much better. Uh, than it was in pre 1990, 1985 or so. So there's a lot much better uh, writing out there about Lafayette than there was when I first started research, and I'm very happy to have contributed something to that to that story. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to go over here. I think you can all see me. Um, if you have a question you'd like to ask me about Lafayette uh, that I can answer, I will gladly do it. Uh, if you'd like to hear a story, I can probably tell you a story too, because he's a pretty he's a pretty interesting guy. So if you have any questions, put them in the chat for me, and I'll read them there, and that way I can read them out to everybody, so they'll be able to hear them as well. How did Lafayette die? Uh, undramatically, <laughs> um, he had the luxury of dying of old age. So uh, he, he did not die a famous death. He, he, he just, like most of us, he just plain old died. But he lived into the, you know, if, if Lafayette had lived a handful of years, uh, we would have a photograph of him. Isn't that amazing? I mean, that's how, that's how young he was during the revolution. If he had only lived you know, five or 10 more years, we'd have, we'd have daguerreotypes of Lafayette, which is just amazing. To me. On his ship, did he bring military people? Also? Oh, yes. He brought a number of other officers, including the Comte de Broglie. Um, he, brought, he brought a lot of stuff that he was going to sell when he got to America because he had to finance his, his own household, his own activities. So he brought an awful lot of, uh, an awful lot of uh, goods that he could then turn around and sell to have money. Um, but he did bring a lot of other French officers with him. Yes, a handful. Your ancestor came from France by Lafayette. Oh, good luck. Um, uh, somebody, had, somebody else had asked me this question uh and actually sent me the information on their on their ancestor do me a favor put put their name in the chat uh and i will see what i can find out for you uh my lafayette shells are behind me in my house you can't see them but uh there are the best way i would be able to find that would be to look at lafayette's letters um there are a lot of people who not surprisingly particularly after 1824 when lafayette toured america uh and he came through ohio as well um, he went to Marietta, hence the Lafayette Hotel of Marietta. Um, a lot of people after that fact made claims to have served with him um, because it was kind of cool to have to say so. Um, but uh, but that's the nature of it. Uh, he died in France at his home in France. Oh, somebody asked where he, what, if he died in natural causes of where he died at his home in France. He was offered land in America during the French Revolution, which, again, is a whole other chat we can have. Um, um, he was offered uh, land here in the French during the French Revolution uh, and and later during the Napoleonic years, but he did not take that. He did not move here, although he could have. Uh, he was not a, he was not a fan of Napoleon. Okay, all right. I will look into that, Mary Hoyer. All right, I'll see if I can look into that, Mary. Thank you. What happened to Lafayette? During, oh gosh, it's a whole other talk. Um, <laughs> Uh, what's interesting about Lafayette during the French Revolution is initially, um, and I'll, I'll tell you a couple stories and then, then I'll, I'll, I don't want to go too far. Um, when the French Revolution first started, um, Lafayette was considered, because he was had taken part in the American Revolution, was considered a, a revolutionary, right? Not surprising. Um, and was considered a, a, a huge, he, he was, I don't know how to put it. He, he's almost like a, a Taylor Swift of the French Revolution. I mean, that was kind of the attitude of, of the French populace towards him, right? So there's a story where early on in the French Revolution, when the when the mobs are going around Paris, and and quite frankly, they're murdering they're murdering priests, right? Because they viewed that as the the, the, the religious estate or the religious component of, of society as part and parcel to the king. So they were going around murdering priests. And one day Lafayette's carriage is going through Paris and there's a mob of men, uh, people, revolutionaries, who have this priest in their hand? They're gonna they're gonna string him up, uh, and Lafayette stops his carriage. And at this time, he had his daughter and he had a son, 
His son's name was George Washington Lafayette, so you're not going to be surprised by that. So what he does is he stops his carriage, and everybody sees his carriage, and he gets out of his carriage with his son. And he holds his son up, and he says, I present to the people of Paris my son, George Washington Lafayette. And, of course, Washington was, was also a huge figure to the French revolutionaries. And they just went crazy. I mean, the crowd just went crazy for this. And while they were doing that, the priest scuttled away. Right? The, the priest managed to just kind of sneak away because they were so enthralled by seeing Lafayette and his son. Um, but <clears throat> unfortunately, that didn't last very long because well, Lafayette is put in command of one of the French Revolutionary Armies that's on the border with Austria. Right. Um, and when and at that time, right when, at, when Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette are in prison and, and are then killed, Lafayette realizes that he can't be a part of this kind of revolution. Right. Um, there, it's one thing to overthrow a king. It's another thing to murder them. Right. It's another thing to perform regicide. And so what Lafayette does is at that time, he steps over the border into Austria and surrenders. All right. And he surrenders himself to the Austrians because he doesn't want to be associated with this regicide. Because, of course, the Austrians have kings as well. And what do you think the Austrians do? They arrest him and throw him in jail as a revolutionary. <laughs> so he spends the majority of the French Revolution in a prison cell in Austria by himself, right? Uh, several years. During that, at a, at, later on, about two or three years into that, his wife, Adrienne, comes along and she stays with them as well with the children. They all stay in the prison cell. Right? Before she does that, though, Adrienne buries all his stuff on their estate so that it can't, so that no one can steal it and pilfer it from it. And among the things that get buried there are two swords. One is a sword he was given by Continental Congress as a, as a thank you at the end of the Revolutionary War. It had a gold hilt and a steel blade. The other sword was a sword he had been given by the King of France for his service in America. And it had a gold hilt and a gold blade. When they came back to France after their imprisonment in Austria and they dug them up, the, st the steel blade had, de had degraded, had rusted and had corroded. So Lafayette had the gold blade from his tin sword put on the mount to his Congress, congressional sword. And that sword is now on display in, in France. So, you know, but that was kind of the kind of, I mean, he survives the Revolutionary War or the French Revolution, um, but mainly it's just because of his name. Um, he does lose some of his estates, <clears throat> which many of the nobles did, but he kept most of his, most of his property. During the Napoleonic War, without getting too far into it, uh, during the Napoleonic War, uh, Lafayette refused to serve with Napoleon. Um, he refused to serve in Napoleon's armies. Um, he, he said, uh, if I had a choice between a dictatorship and a democracy, I'll choose a democracy every time. And he said that to Napoleon's face. So it tells you an awful lot about both his status, uh, how he was held by the French people, that Napoleon left him alone for the most part. But it also tells you an awful lot about his attitude towards how Right. And how he felt it should be shared. Um, when George Washington dies in 1799, Napoleon holds a huge festival in his honor, and he purposely refuses to invite Lafayette. Right. So that that tells you an awful lot about uh, the relationship between Lafayette and Napoleon. Now, had Lafayette played nice with Napoleon, uh, he would have served in his armies. We'd have a we'd have books about what kind of general he was. Um, but because he didn't, all we have is his battle at Jamestown in 1781. And that's why it's so worth studying if you want to understand the Marquis de Lafayette. Um, thank you very much for joining me today for this little discussion. I can talk about Lafayette forever um, and always, um, but I appreciate you being willing to, in, to indulge me today. I hope you learned a little bit about Lafayette. Uh, maybe you look at him a little differently the next time you see his statue. Remember, he was an incredibly good looking man because I had to play him, right? So he, he couldn't have been that bad looking. So here we go. So we'll go with that. So thank you all for attending. Uh, again, this is being recorded. I will put a recording of it on the OGS website, um, hopefully today uh, or tomorrow, uh, so you can view it, along with links to the articles that I've written about him and maybe some other things that you can see. So thank you all for joining me, and have a great visit. Or visit. Sorry, I'm thinking about Colonial Williamsburg here. Have a great day. Enjoy yourself.